Good evening, everyone. My name is Sam, and on behalf of BookSoup, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for tonight's event with Maria Kuznetsova and Megan Cummins, here to discuss something unbelievable and if the body allows it. We'll be hosting more virtual events in the near future, and you can learn more about them on our website by following us on social media at BookSoup, signing up for our email newsletter, or you can follow us right here on Crowdcast to get notifications directly. Our next event is tomorrow at 5 p.m. Pacific with Namina Forna and Amelie Wenzhou discussing their books, The Gilded Ones and Red Tigress for Independent Bookstore Day. So that'll be at 5 p.m. Um, please join us or go shopping at your independent bookstores. Tomorrow's a big day for small bookstores, so it's going to be fun, and most of us have some exciting things going on. So check the socials for all of that. And our past events are also available on our YouTube channel if you're interested in seeing what's been going on the last year. So tonight's event will end with a Q&A, and to submit a question, please use the ask a question section at the bottom of the screen. It's to the left of the chat area. And if you see a question on the list that you'd like for our speakers to answer, please click the like button. We will try to answer as many questions as time will allow. And please also feel free to engage in the chat area as you already are. Also, please considering supporting BookSoup and our authors tonight by purchasing a copy of our author's books, which you can do by clicking the green button right below the viewer screen if you don't have it already. This will redirect you to our website where you can finish the checkout process and it should not interrupt viewing. I think it opens in a new window, so you should be okay to do that at any time. And we are also selling books through Libro FM for those who prefer audiobooks. And we're also open for in-store browsing. So if you're local, you can come in um, to get a physical copy if you would rather do that. And we are open from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. So with all that said, let me introduce our guest for this evening. Megan Cummins' book, If the Body Allows It, was long listed for the Story Prize and the Penn Bingham Award for Debut Story Collection. She lives in Brooklyn, where she is the managing editor of a public space. Welcome, Megan. And our other guest tonight, Maria Kuznetsova, was born in Kyiv, Ukraine, and moved to the United States as a child. Her first novel, Oksana Behave, was published in 2019. She lives in Auburn, Alabama, with her husband and daughter, where she is an assistant professor of creative writing at Auburn University. She is also a fiction editor at the Bear Life Review, a journal of immigrant and refugee literature. And without further ado, I'm going to turn the camera over to Megan and Maria. Please sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation. Thank you both for being with us tonight. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. It's great to be here. Um, this is a really special reading um, to read with Maria, one of my oldest friends. Um, we went to grad school together and I'm just so happy. I know we'll, we'll get to the conversation part of it, so I won't uh, gush too much about how much I love Maria's work right now. But um, I'm so excited to get to read two from my book, um, my first book. Um, and I was looking at what I wanted to read and thinking about what I wanted to read. and. Um, what I've been working on for the past couple of years is a novel that has grown out of one of the stories in the book. Um, and it's a story called Aerosol. And I decided that I wanted to read a couple pages from this novel that I've been working on. Um, first time I've ever read any of it, first time anyone has ever heard it. So um, it's work um, in progress, but it's been in progress for several years. So it's not like I, you know, wrote it last night and then came to my cage, decided to come to my reading and read it. But um, uh, so I'm going to read this apart from sort of the opening of, of the book. Um, I walked home from the party cradling my broken wrist and the feeling that I never made a bigger mistake in my life. The garage door was open and the bare bulb in the rafters glowed above the empty milk jug that my mom had hung from the ceiling so she'd know how far to go without hitting the lawnmower. Her car was gone, but my dad was there sitting in his white plastic chair, the one next to it, mine, empty. His wrist hung over the arm of the chair and there was a cigarette between his fingers. The frigid air, the adrenaline from my fall had sobered me and now his smoke did too. It cleared my head of everything and all I could feel was gravity pulling down on the broken bits of my bones. I sat down next to him. He handed me a thermos of coffee he picked up from the ground next to him. Hi, hon, he said, you look like you need this. His eyes were bright, he might have been sober, and I took a sip. I'm not that drunk, I said, but I was shy at having been caught. 
Or I wasn't anyway. I wish I'd been though. He laughed. His laugh turned into a cough. You look a little feverish. He switched his cigarette between hands and placed his palm on my forehead. I held my wrist up and winced. I think I might need to go to the hospital. Oh boy, he said, stubbing out his cigarette. In a minute though, I said, I just need a minute and some more coffee. He leaned back in his chair. Only a minute, he said. The garage faced a patch of woods. The trees were too serious and lifeless in the dark and cold, and their branches had been iced into syringes. I couldn't feel my fingers in either hand. I looked down at them. In a flash before my eyes, Gabe's hand was there, leading me up the stairs of the house where I'd just been, decorated for Christmas with twinkle lights, two Christmas trees, a rich girl lived there. I touched my cheek. Gabe's breath had been there when we'd talked close in the kitchen. Did I tell you about the time I was visiting Michael in Boston and I got drunk and jumped into the Charles River? My stomach twisted at Michael's name. He and my dad had grown up together and he was my best friend, Cindy's dad. Gabe was Cindy's boyfriend. No, I said, you know my mom would be mad if you told me that. Well, it seems like it might make you feel a little better about yourself, my dad said, if you wanna hear it. He wrinkled his eyes with a smile behind his smudged glasses. His eyebrows were long enough that they touched the frames. One of his teeth was brown from smoking. Somehow he always looked serene. Sure, I said. I jumped in and cut myself on something. I don't know what it was, like a steel rod or some crap that was stuck in the river. I was bleeding really bad, but I was so drunk I refused to go to the hospital. Your Uncle Ansel was there too. We'd come up from New York together. I woke up the next morning and the sheets were covered in blood. I couldn't remember anything. I told the nurse giving me the tetanus shot that I had just woken up like that. He laughed at the memory and I laughed too, but in truth, it didn't make me feel any better about myself. That was before you met mom, I said. Oh yeah, he said. Well, I just slipped on ice. It would have happened if I'd been sober too. It would have happened if mom had been there. Don't be so sure, he said. She has a sixth sense for imminent disaster. Where is she, I asked. He shrugged. I think she went to a meeting. I told her I was coming over to get some things. I think she wanted to make herself scarce. That's bullshit, I said. She's avoiding the inconvenience of having a family. Hey, he said softly, that's not fair. Get up, time to face the music, time to go to the hospital. My dad moved his chair into the garage, reached up for the pull string to turn off the light and pulled his keys out of his jacket pocket. It was a spring jacket with ribbed sweater cuffs and he wore it no matter how cold or warm it was. His car was parked on the street. I followed him to it. He opened the passenger door and took out a box of his things that had been sitting there. He set it down in the ditch and he beckoned me to get in. The car was full of his things. I thought you were just going to rehab, I said, that mom said you could come back after. She said we could talk after. I just don't see why you have to take all this stuff with you. I like my things. Dad, shh, Gertie, just get in before you're in too much pain, before the adrenaline wears off, we gotta go. The engine brightened the night. The headlights lit up the quiet. I held my hand to the vents, even though the heat was still cold. I can't believe you have to go to Minnesota for three months in the winter. It's even colder there than here. Well, I tried all the rehabs in Michigan. Apparently they didn't work. That's not funny. You didn't try all the rehabs. And anyway, isn't there one in Florida you could try? It's only three months, Gertie. Three months turned to four. That talk between them never happened. And then my dad met a guy who knew a guy who worked in advertising in Sioux Falls. So that's where he went next. Thank you. Uh, that was amazing. Oh my God. Um, I've been hearing about this, this book for years and um, I'm so excited to, to talk about it and that all of us got a chance to read it. Um, thank you everyone for being here. Um, thank you, Book Soup, for, for having us. I, I was 
at the actual book soup two years ago to read from my novel, my first novel, Oksana Behave. Um, California is, I lived there for seven years, which is the longest I've lived in any one place in my life. So it's near and dear to my heart. Um, support your indies, go out, you know, buy a few dozen copies of me and Megan's books. Uh, <laughs> <local> indie. <laughs> um, it's, it's really important. They do everything for us. And um, I'm so grateful to the indies, to the audience, to Megan. Here I go. Um, okay, so here's my new novel, Something Unbelievable. It came out last week. And um, it's about a 30-something actress who puts on a play based on her grandmother's World War II story. Um, and it alternates perspectives between the grandmother and the granddaughter. And I'm gonna read just a little bit of the grandmother Larissa's section. Um, it's 1941. Her family and a second family are fleeing Kiev, Ukraine. The Nazis are coming in um, and they're on a train to evacuate. I think that's all you need to know. I'm gonna read for about six minutes. Okay. After a so-called lunch consisting of black bread and black tea was served and the train made its first stop, Mama and Papa left us to see if they could be of use. Papa found a cloth to bundle a baby and some valerian root for a hysterical woman and Mama found work in the kitchen, which meant she would prepare food and frantically serve it whenever the train stopped. Papa also rushed around helping out factory workers, many of them complete strangers to him. His old orphanage helped others at all cost instincts kicking right in. Just once in the evening, Papa found time for us. He crashed down and kissed Paulina and me on our foreheads. It had been a draining day, the air in the car as thick as butter, melting all of us. My strong young women, he said, stroking our hair like we were children. How proud you make me. If we make you so proud, Papa, then why don't you stay with us, said my sister. Because there are many people here who need more help than you. There's a newborn who's so scared she refuses to eat, he told her, but she was not convinced. He tussled her hair again and left to speak solemnly to Uncle Constantine, plotting his next move the next time the train stopped. When I felt a hand on my shoulder a little while later, I hoped it was Papa returning, but I was not disappointed to find Misha hovering above us. Do you girls need anything, he asked. His hair was slick and resolute, like the rest of him. I looked around the compartment, with everyone rustling about and trying to unpack and create some order to face this unknowable day and the ones that would come after it. We were as beaten down and sunless as mushrooms, stalked away deep in a forest. What more could we need, I said, and this got him to smile. Of course, he said, giving me a nod as he walked toward his father and Uncle Nikita. Well, you know where to find me. The boy was more handsome than his father, but he had the same imposing nose and broad shoulders. I could see him one day manning a factory, a tank, or a platoon. Our situation had hardened his jaw and he was even more appealing under duress. And now he was hoping the men would let him into the adult sphere as they conferenced about the bombs falling on Leningrad, speculating that the worst would come for the city once winter set in because the Germans had surrounded it. Even if its people didn't run out of food, they could freeze to death. When he was just out of earshot, my sister batted her eyes at me and lowered her voice. Do you need anything? She said, imitating Mishka in a husky voice and giggling at herself. She had teased me about him before, but I did not mind it until that moment. Normally, I enjoyed the flattery, even if I did not quite believe her. Not many boys had paid attention to me the way they did to Polya, and it did not hurt to have it pointed out. But her joking around just then was downright inappropriate. Shut up, idiotic girl, I said. He was just trying to help. Are you kidding? Misha's so in love with you, now more than ever, she said. Who can think of love at a time like this, I said smacking her scrawny arm harder than I intended. Silly girl, we could die any minute and here you have your head in the clouds. Her bottom lip trembled and I braced myself for the floodgates to open, but they did not. I have to keep busy somehow, don't I? Read a book, I told her, and then I reached into my bag and pulled out the idiot, perhaps to justify hefting such a heavy tome to the mountains. But she did not ask to borrow a book. She just crossed her arms and pouted for an impressively long time. When the fathers were done conferencing, Misha patrolled the aisles, attempting to look helpful. When he could not find a function for himself, he stood at the window and watched the landscape for what seemed like eternity without even a twitch in his jaw, impressing me once more with his stillness. Mama and Papa returned eventually and crawled straight into bed as the sun had hardly had a chance to sink below the horizon. 
The train traversed the distant land, which was far more remote than the field surrounding the Orlov's immense dacha on the outskirts of the city. I watched the long grass, the occasional cracked huts, the thin-looking cows wandering here and there, munching at the grass, the horses swinging their wild, ancient tails. Baba Tonya had fallen asleep, and Polya returned to my side. She seemed to have forgotten our earlier fight and was only tired and frightened. Her stomach growled as she moved closer to me, tugging on my sleeve. I'm scared, Lara, she said, chewing on a strand of fiery hair. While I snapped, don't be. But this did not ward her off. She studied the dark fields as if they contained the answers she wanted. What do you think will happen to us out there? A tear fell down her pink round cheek and I almost felt sorry for the girl. There were no suitors to ogle her here and our parents were too busy to lavish upon her the praise and love she expected. Her other joy was hearing her grandmother's stories of soirees and the old woman was too distraught to offer those. And her formerly gorgeous red hair was greasy and wilted. I considered noting that we were less likely to get blasted to pieces if we got the hell out of Kiev, but I didn't want to make her cry over her friends again. We'll just have to wait and see, won't we? I said, patting her hand. I don't like the sound of that. This isn't about what you like and don't like. I noticed something strange in the landscape, which I mistook for planks of wood and then understood were suitcases, strewn about without reason. Was it a sign people had been carted away and forced to leave their things behind, or had they decided to drop them because they were too heavy to carry? My sister was sniffling beside me, and it was a sad sight to behold. I wiped the snot under her nose with the back of my hand. Across from us, their love brothers rested facing a wall. The backs of their dark heads were identical from that particular angle, and there was no telling who was who. Fine, fine, Misha might have a crush on me. Are you happy now? She smiled the smile of a flatulent baby. I knew it. I shook my head at this ridiculous notion, but I allowed her the small victory. Come on now, let's go to sleep, I said, and she rested beside me. I wondered, was it true? Did Misha have any feelings for me or was he just trying to help in a time of crisis? As I observed Misha's sleeping form rising and falling across for me, I tried to tell myself that our destination would not be completely bleak because he would be there. Being near him during our evacuation and resettlement tinged the uncertain future with an aura of romance. It would be a thrilling adventure, not a descent into chaos. There would be an entire step just for me and Misha whispering sweet nothings across a snowy divide. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> Yay, we did it. Sorry, I just had to turn my mic back on. Um, that was so wonderful. I love that scene so much. And I don't know, in the camera, I- uh, Oh, <laughs> thank sorry, you. I put, mine, I put the mind there too, but then it yes, fell off. put your book there because we're, we're moving and I have no books left. There's nothing, there's nothing oh. in this room. It's very sad. But if oh. <laughs> you have books, yours would be the second one I have after mine. <laughs> That's so sweet. Um, well, this, I love that scene. That's one. I just tore through Maria's book when I first read it um, this past winter. Um, I was lucky enough to get an early copy. Um, and I just remember that train on the scene so vividly. Um, and I just want to say that I, I know one thing that we kind of want to talk about is the fact that Maria and I met in 2011, no, 2009. Oh Gosh, my God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we were just out of college. We met in the aughts. Um, at UC Davis, and one of the very first scenes or stories I read from you, it's actually an excerpt from the, a novel you were working on, and um, there was a scene on the train, and I have this vivid memory of this sort of gorgeous, like moonlit train scene, um, and one of the characters' nose starts bleeding, and um, that that scene has struck me ever since, and so I'm, you know. And I stole from it from start to finish when writing this new book. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, beautiful then and beautiful now. Um, but yeah, Maria, Maria, let's just like kind of jump in. What um, what made you want to read that scene tonight? Yeah, good question. Um, well, I've never read from that part before. Um, and I thought since you and I have talked a lot about um, writing from the perspective of young characters and since you you know write some YA and things like that I thought it would be fun to read um not a more lighthearted part but I think just a part where 
um, you could kind of get a sense of the historical aspects, but you had some of some of the usual drama that you would get not in the war. Um, yeah, and, and just for my UC Davis friends, uh, it just for the fun, like, uh, of if anyone remembered my first novel, I like, like there's lines, the, my first novel that um, didn't end up getting published, uh, but that I worked on for like seven years, um, it was called The Accident and it was about Chernobyl. And so the first, um, one of the opening scenes was the families evacuate in Chernobyl and there's a more strong-willed narrator and then her friend who's, in that case, not like a hot friend, but she's more of a, a nervous, weak friend, you know, so it's the same dynamic where she's trying to calm the friend down instead of a sister. But um, a lot of the little beats kind of stayed stayed with me and mm. I just, you know, stole them and carried them over into this book. <laughs> and what, what made you decide to finally read from your work that tonight was the night? It was an amazing you. scene. Um, thank you. Um, I, you know, I have been like trying to pull this novel across the finish line for um, like a long time. I keep, for about two years, I've been saying it's gonna be done in a month. Um, and so 24 <laughs> months later, it's still not done. I've said that 24 times. Um, and it's finally like almost there, I think. Um, I mean, definitely, you know, I'm sure that after 24 months of, of thinking it's almost there and it not being almost there, and, I'm realistic to the the idea that you know it still needs work, but um, I I I kind of wrote this new beginning um, about a month ago, and I've been kind of working on it since then. And it finally felt um, like it might not be the very very beginning. I might have something like before it, but um, it finally felt like the place to start the book because this, as I said, you know this um um novel grew out of a story in the collection. And so for a long time, I had the beginning of the novel just like as that story, like mm -hmm. kind of tweaked, but like, I just kind of, it was almost like structurally exactly the same. And, you know, parts of the story are still like in the beginning of the novel in that way. But um, I felt like I had like a story and then like a novel without a beginning tacked onto it. Um, and so I, I kind of finally felt like I found a place that like almost feels like the right place to start. And um, and it felt like, you know, since I, I was, I, I knew a lot of our old friends would be here and I and getting to read with my oldest friends. Um, I felt like, you know, now's the time to sort of write, to, to read this, um, this novel that has been completely inside my head for years. And uh, yeah, it felt nice to, nice to read it. Like I definitely, Notice some things I want to change, but uh, yeah, like that's it. It was amazing. And do you ever, for, for me, like when I read one line, I was like, oh, this is writing. Like, which, which one? Uh, we were as beaten down in fullness as mushrooms stalked away deep in a forest. That's the kind of line that you write and you're like, cool, I'm done. And then you have to read it out loud. And then you're like, ooh, that's like cringy literary writing. You ever feel that when you read your work aloud and you're just like, this seemed okay written down, but now. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I was like, especially like when there's a line you feel so proud of yourself for, yeah. you're like, oh my God, like, I am such a good writer. <laughs> off the cuff. Yeah, right. Friday um, night of something you read just now and you're like, ooh. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, and it's, um, you know, it's, I think, it's funny when you finally like let your work go and either read it aloud or have someone else read it, um, you know, it's funny, I think the lines, like if they if there is a line that they like or if there are lines that they like, it's never the ones that I think yeah. that people will like. The ones like, it's exactly what you said, the ones where you're like, mm, so proud of myself, like that's such a great literary line. It's like, <laughs> those are the ones that people are like, okay, okay, you know, and then it's like something else that might stick out. Um, so yeah, gotta, gotta like take a step back. <laughs> yeah, but I think that's why, we, I mean, yeah, it's like when my books, or like with Oksana, I would read from it a lot and then I would be editing it constantly. And I wished I had that pressure before it was published, you know, to like really kind of think about um, whether every line deserved its place there. Um, but your, your opening, you know, I wish I had, um, you know, some of my students here, like it did all the right things that an opening should do. Um, it established two characters. It had, um, you know, gave us some world building and backstory 
uh, but not too much, you know, and it had a forward momentum. It wasn't just like an info dump. Um, what else, what else to do? It had a voice. It had all the things to, to keep going, you know? Um, I think at, at UC Davis, um, Ian Lee, who was my first workshop instructor, like she talked about um, your readers want to put stuff on, um, like think of them as like a mountain climber climbing a mountain with a backpack and you want to give them enough stuff in the backpack to keep going. But if you give them too much, they fall off. If you don't give them enough, they starve to death. Mm. And I feel like that that gave just enough for us to keep going. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll, I have two, two thoughts um, or two questions. Like since we did go to grad school together at UC Davis a decade ago, and since we both done MFA since then and have you know lived a lot since then like what what stuck with you from that early early you know time in grad school yeah that is a great question and I want to hear the same sort of your thoughts on the same question um you know I it's I've I've spent a long you know it's been a long time since then I did another MFA after that have as you said lived you know we lived 10 years of a life um more than that. Um, and right now I'm in sort of my job, I'm in a position like I have former students and I also have like, I, I'm an editor at a publisher. So I have like former interns and um, staff um, and some of them decide to go to MFA programs. And so I get asked like, as I'm sure you do too, Maria, to write recommendations for MFAs or to um, just sort of give advice about like, when should I go to an MFA? Um, and you know, I always, I kind of tell, usually tell them that, um, you know, I went to an MFA as you did right out of undergrad. And, you know, at the time, like as a 22 year old might, like I thought I would graduate from that program and like publish my book right away, you know, that that was gonna be <laughs> a trajectory. And obviously it wasn't, but um, it was, it worked for me, you know? And I think um, um, I'm gonna quote, since, you know, your book has, um, Russian literature, and I'm going to quote Tolstoy, patience and time, these are my mighty warriors. Um, <laughs> and so I, I think something that I learned, luckily I learned it sort of early after graduating from UC Davis was that like, oh, this is going to take a lot longer and I'm okay with that, you know? And I, I really encourage or try to encourage people to sort of like give up the fetishization of the young writer, you know? And young can mean any, like we're young, writers you know but like i think it's like the 25 year old <laughs> Maria. Yeah, writers. <laughs> so like the you know it's like if you don't publish by 25 if you're not on the 30 under 30 list or something like that and just like ignore like that's great if that happens that's wonderful but just if not ignore it you know um anyway so i i feel like i kind of strayed from your from your no, question no. But, um what was important for me at davis is that like it gave me time when I was young to write without any inhibition. You know, I knew nothing. Like I knew nothing about publishing. I knew nothing about um, even kind of like craft or anything, but I just wrote and I wrote a lot of pages. Um, and there's one story in my collection that I wrote at UC Davis. So it, you know, one of the, those stories that I, I, I did eventually end up at a place that- Which was um, uh, no counter girls. It's one of the early stories in the book um, oh, about. I was in that workshop. No, you weren't. That was. Um, you were a year. You were a year below me, so we weren't always. Right. That was in my second year. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So it. You know, just writing a lot without the pressure. You know, that was a great thing about UC Davis is that there wasn't. I felt anyway. There wasn't any pressure about like what came next and. You know, later when I ended up doing another MFA, I was glad to have more pressure. Like there, there was more, a little more pressure because it was a program that was close to New York, you know? So there was just that proximity to the publishing culture that you couldn't help but sort of be influenced by. Um, so what, what are your thoughts on Sam? What did you take away from UC Davis and since then and sort of what from your trajectory? Yeah, I think uh, I was gonna say like you said, you know, I published one thing from my two years at, at Davis. Um, but you were writing, and I think I was too, like based on the first novel that didn't get published and then was, you know, influenced this one. Like we were still writing in our world, you know, like all your stories were mostly, you know, set in the dark, you know, underbelly of Michigan and, uh, you know, had a lot of humor and like grit um, and young narrators. And I think um, I, you know, came to Davis just being like, I guess I'm interested in like my 
you know, Russian, Soviet, Ukrainian, whatever you want to call it, heritage and like what it means to me. And though maybe the things I wrote there, you know, were just an exercise. I think they taught me how to write about a world that was interested in without like, yeah, I didn't like, I didn't know what an agent was or what, how to, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, I didn't think about that until after we graduated. And I think that was really good. But then when I went to Iowa, it was like the opposite extreme where it was like, oh, you wrote one story, like you should get an agent now or it's too late, you know? And I think um, that combination of the two was was really good. But yeah, I think the backpack thing from Ian Lee really stuck with me, just, just that backpack. <laughs> what yeah. do you put in it? What do you take out of it? And I think um, the feedback I always got at Davis was, as people here might know, is like, there's too much going on in your stories. There's too much crap, you know, on every page. And I, th I still got that critique, you know, years later at Iowa, but... Um, but I kind of learned to work with it more and to like embrace the the crowdedness, but make it like not suck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it's like you have to go, you know, you have to embrace what comes to you naturally, even if it's too much, you know, it's um one when, when I, I one thing my French teacher taught me is that um the word too much has been <laughs> like it's an it's a word that they use now, like the French people sometimes use, like it's like, oh, say too much. It's like they use it in the English words, like in French. Um, and they also turned it into a noun, la too muchite. Um, <laughs> and so I like to use that all the time now. And she has told me that they actually don't use it that much. So you're like using that too, you're using too much, too much. But um, all that to say, you, like, I think you have to like, when you are developing as a writer, you have to really like go full throttle into like what, what you're good at, what you're drawn to, and then like find the balance. What what was your I guess that's like a more eloquent way of saying being extra or something. Um, what what did you what because I feel like you know your strength is your weakness, right? So um, in my novel, like it starts like with a cast of forty characters, you know, to be like this is what it's going to be. There's going to be nine generations of women and a lot of you know crap in between. Um, so did you have a thing that you feel like you you always heard was a critique of your work that was like like what was the main critique you got and then how did you turn it into something good like what was the thing you heard over and over in workshop yeah the i think i heard um like over the the main thing that I, I would hear is that like it's like the thing that i was obsessed with like i loved writing about michigan and lakes <laughs> and you know things like that like kind of depressing stories but um <laughs> but very funny yes yeah, so, but also tried to be funny um but i think the thing i heard most what was that? No, they are funny, not just trying to be. Thank you. Um, but like the thing I heard most is that like, it's just like, I was so so focused on trying to make like the sentences beautiful. And so like my, they were just so packed with like similes and I love similes so much. And I think that's kind of why I have started writing uh, at least for the past couple of years, almost only about like teenage characters. Because I think like when you're, when you're a teenager the world is just so charged with metaphor, you know? and um, not that it isn't when you're an adult too, but um, I just love that it's like, I feel that agency with the teenage character to like kind of pack in the similes a little bit. And I definitely have to pull, pull it back. But um, at, at Rutgers, my teacher, Alice Elliot Dark um, was like, you're good at similes, but like, girl, you, got, you have to rein it in. Um, and so that was, I think the main critique that I would usually get is like, you know, the language, you're trying to make the language beautiful, but it's not, um, there's no link to like the the meaning of the story with it. You know, it's like not, it's like just kind of a, a tangent going off in a different direction of a beautiful sentence. Um, and I still allow myself that because I think I would like to argue that that's okay sometimes, you know, to have that because it's what I like. Um, and if you don't like it, that's okay, but it, I do. Um, but yeah, that was probably the big thing. And then also like, you know, I, I would never care much too much about plot until like a little bit later. Um, but yeah. What? I'm surprised to hear that because I feel like your stuff is really well plotted. Um, even just the, the opening of that novel, you could see like you set everything up beautifully. Um, so when you're writing, because I'm, I don't think ever, anyone's ever told me I write, <laughs> my, I, my, I make my language too beautiful. Uh, well, I don't know that they thought it was beautiful. I think they, they thought it was trying to be beautiful, not that it was. What, you, know, but you, do, you are more, you're very lyrical, not always lyrical, but you have um, this tendency in a good way. So how do you, 
Um, no, like when you allow yourself to have one of those, like for me, I feel like it's a joke when I'm like, huh, okay, I'm going to make one more, even though it's probably too many, too bad. Like, and which you also are very funny, but when you're, you know, deciding which similes to actually keep, how do you know which one? Is it just ones you like or are they more tangential to the plot or you just don't care because you like the line? Like, how do you make those decisions? That's a, that's a good question. I think it's it's kind of the same with humor for me. Like, if it doesn't, if I like, if I do, if there's any humor in my stories, um, like it has to come kind of immediately. You know, if I'm like thinking, and I think it's the same with like language and, and lyricism, um, it has to be like the first thing, or it kind of just has to come to mind without thinking about it. If I like go back and try to think about it, um, it feels forced and doesn't feel natural. Um, so that's kind of like, I don't think I've ever, I never really noticed myself in like flow state. If you like ever heard writers talk about flow state to me, I feel like I never really get into it. What is that? How do I? It's, it's it? like you're writing and like two hours passed and you didn't realize it, you know, like I, I guess. But um, I feel like for me, it's almost like I might get into flow state, but for like three seconds at a time. It's like, um, <laughs> um, yeah, it has to kind of come like, um, but, um, what I, so I, um, I wanted to talk quickly because I like, I love in your book how we have Larissa as a teenager and as an adult. I loved, I think Laura Spence Ash said, it was so great to hear Larissa in your voice. And I agree. And it also was so great to hear young but, Larissa your voice um and also people you should submit your questions too in the ask yeah. us future we will definitely i mean we can talk we could talk till midnight you know but um or suggest you know, a topic that's a good yeah option. yeah suggest a topic too what do you want to what do you want to hear us talk about night. <laughs> Friday night, guys um and um but anyway i i'm interested in that you're in the fact that your book does child and adult larissa and i'm i was wondering when you were writing her like how did you think about Larissa, like from a writing craft perspective, when you were writing her as a child versus writing her as an adult? Because it feels so, so true. But I've never done that. I've never like had a story or anything that had both like young and old, you know? And it seems like it would be really hard. So how did you think about that? Yeah, you know, I'd never done that before either. Um, and I'm still, I, I, I sometimes wondered it's tricky because you know she's um, a teenager during the war, and then she's almost ninety when she's telling the story. But also, she um, has changed a lot. Like all of her values basically flipped. Like when she started the war, she was like serious and bookish, which she still had a love for literature. But she um, kind of became the way her sister was, which is more frivolous in terms of like she married a wealthy man, started carrying on affairs, um, cared about how she looked. You know, so so I try to when I felt like the voices weren't the same, I tried to excuse it by being like, well, she changed a lot and she's, you know, 70 years older or whatever. Um, but I, but I just tried to, um, yeah, like when it came down to observations and, and jokes and things, I would just try to think like, just go back, toggle back and forth, look at the young voice and say, would the older Larissa think this? And then look at her when she's older and think about like, with this older character who thought this say that, um, but I don't, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it was really hard. Um, it was one of the many challenges, like my first novel was a coming of age book where it was like, she's gonna be two years older for 10 chapters, awesome. Like I don't really think about structure and things like, or, or the voice changing or anything, but with this um, part of the challenges was like dipping in and out and knowing when old Larissa was gonna go into the past and then when she's gonna come back and how she would think of the past as the old woman. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I never had, I, I never feel like I, I figured out quite how to do it. I just try to like, it's like the read aloud test, but without reading it out loud, just looking at the sentences and being like, does this sound to me like the same person? Um, you know, even if they're almost a century apart. Um, yeah, I have, a, I have a question for you, maybe not sort of related, um, just in terms of, like, you know, we said, let's read stuff from the young, you know, young characters, talk about YA, yada, yada. And you said, do you still think that book is YA? Do you think what you read is YA or isn't? And because I have, you know, now, now I have grad students. Um, 
and a lot of them are saying they're writing YA. And so I asked them partly because I don't really know, you know, um, like what, why do you think this is YA? What distinguishes it from, from an adult, you know, literary fiction or whatever with a young narrator? Like um, I just reread To Kill a Mockingbird since I live in Alabama and, um, and it's, you know, all told from a child's perspective and is a hundred percent for adults. So like, how do you, yeah, just any any kind of comment. Because what you read to me sounded like literary fiction. That was really good. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, that's a great question. And I think um, I am kind of, I've, I've been thinking about it a lot because I, um, you know, there are several stories in my book that are set from the teenage point of view. And um, I felt like I wanted to try to, kind of break down the idea that like for it to be appealing for it for something to be appealing to teenagers it couldn't be literary you know and I, I think um so I've been interested in that crossover you know in that sort of like realm of crossover um because you know there I don't know if you remember there was that article in I think it was in the times several years ago that just sort of like maligned adults for reading YA fiction and yeah, that, I, remember that. <laughs> I can't remember who the writer was but she just tore, you know, <laughs> tore adults apart for reading, like. Um, what was the, I remember seeing it like in the ether, but I don't know that I've read it. What was the overarching critique of why it was bad? Um, I, I think that was, she wasn't critiquing YA as being bad. She was critiquing adults who read YA. Right. Why, why, like, why was it bad? I think she was like, you're wasting your brain. Um, and I, I just kind of, first of all, I, I kind of disagree in general, you know, with people critiquing people's like reading habits, like why it seems like a pointless exercise. But um, anyway, it's, um, I, I wanted to kind of think like, you know, there's, um, you know, teenagers are like the most mature they've ever been in their lives. Like we make them read Shakespeare. We make them, you know, in school we have that, you know, they read, um, you know, I read The Doll Maker in high school where a, a child's legs get cut off by a train. You know, I just think it's like, we 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 underestimate their kind of maturity. And, I, and I'm also not saying there, there's definitely a value too in like YA literature that is like, um, like just about, you know, about romance or about like, you know, not dealing with sort of like intense topics. But I think, um, you know, kids are equipped to, um, and interested in reading um, like li more literary YA. Um, and so I, I don't know, maybe it's crossover. Maybe it's like, I, I think the book definitely gets more YA-ish as it goes along. Um, even though I just kind of spent five minutes saying like, there's no distinction, <laughs> you know, but. Um, what is YA-ish to you? I think um, it's, um, yeah. Oh, I was it's, just gonna, yeah, sorry. Zoom. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. I was gonna say when I, wrote that Chernobyl novel, the thing I kept hearing from agents was like, is it YA or isn't it? We don't know, so we can't sell it. And I was like, really? Like, I just think it's, like, for me, I felt like it was a young narrator, yeah. but it yeah. was literary fiction. But it sounds like you're writing for like the brainy high school student you were. Like you would want your, or, or that I, you know, attempted yeah. to be, which sounds. Yeah, that I wanted to be. Yeah, it's um that could be that could be part of it for sure. Um, I think maybe I felt like there wasn't quite that book. You know, like I mean, I enjoyed reading like what was assigned. You know, for the I mean, not everything, but like, you know, and then outside of that, I just you know, like I read Barbara Kingsolver and like, um, and I read fantasy books because I liked those. But um, I yeah, I guess I I don't guess. I guess I don't have like a super good answer for like what the delineation is between why. Yeah, and I think I think the the real my real answer is that we think too much about it, and it's like it doesn't actually have the import. I mean, I guess it does from a marketing point of view. I'm not a marketing person, but um, it's uh, I don't know. It's I I just want to write about like teenagers, you know, doing yeah. making mistakes and um. You know, I, uh, I when I sent an earlier draft of this novel to my agent, she said there was too much drama between the teens. <laughs> so, 
She said she had too much drama between the teams. <laughs> There's never so I was like, it's YA. I thought you couldn't have too much drama in YA. That's why I decided to write it. Um, so I, I'm trying to like tone it down a little bit. But um, is does she like does she envision it as YA or is that a comment toward pushing it to be more literary, whatever that I means? Think, I think we haven't quite discussed that yet. Like she, I've been calling it YA. Yeah. And I, she's on board board with that. So I think we're sort of like, I think we're kind of operating in the crossover zone right now, which, um, you know, like I think of, I love, one of the books I love is um, Marlena by Julie Button. Um, oh, yeah. I love and I see that um, Rich via Kelly's computer asked us what other fiction writers we think write teenage characters well. And that is sort of like one of my number one is Julie Button's Marlena. And um, it has a frame of Marlena as an adult. Mm -hmm. Like it also feels like very much feels like a YA book to me too, you know, but in a literary crossover sort of way. Um, yeah, I'm trying to, you know, I love that book. I'm trying to think, because I would say to me, it just felt like literary fiction. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe it's like, you're right, like, you know, like in high school, they make you read like night and like, you know, you read like stuff about like the worst shit on earth, but it's you're 16. So why can't, yeah. You, why, why can't a 16 year old read about addiction in an intelligent way? Like that makes a lot of sense. Um, who writes, you know, I teach a class for Catapult on the magic of the young narrator, um, which I don't know, what is the magic? I don't know, but um, you know, David Vismoskis, Natasha, it's like one of my all time favorite short stories. Oh, I uh, love that story. So good. And the movie he himself made uh, about the book is amazing, which who would expect that? Um, it's just a, a young kid growing up, um, immigrant from Belarus, growing up in Toronto and his cousin visits and, you know, hilarity and sexual mishaps ensue. And it's just the best, it's just the best. Uh, I, I taught it this, I teach it like every semester. Um, so I think he, he just nails it. Um, yeah, I so learned the definition of solipsism from that story. The what? I learned the definition of solipsism. Oh, yeah. from the, I, didn't know, I didn't know what that word meant before I read that story. <laughs> from his uh. philosopher drug dealer friend Rufus who has uh, Greek columns and a pool being put into his backyard. Um, everyone should read Natasha and watch the movie. Um, yeah, you know, Jupe Lahiri, uh, Hell Heaven. I just love that story. Um, and uh, Once in a Lifetime as well. Those are the two I teach. I guess Hell Heaven has an adult looking back. Um, but still, yeah, I just think she captures in a totally, completely different. Um, those to me are like the poles of, of literary fiction. Like Vismozgis is like, in terms of like how funny and sharp you can be versus how like lyrical and eloquent and like still both are like a 10. Um, yeah, so I think I think those two, um, you know, I reread Speak recently uh, by Lauren Halsey Anderson. Um, if you read Speak, you know, it was like this big YA bestseller. Um, it's about a girl going through high school and you kind of learn that she was assaulted, sexually assaulted um, kind of halfway through, um, but it's, you know, it's, it's split up by semester um, and like her grade, you know, the marking period starts off each, each part of the book. Um, and it's just really well done. It's, it's an amazing, it's a total page turner and it's really, her voice is so sharp and funny. Um, what else is in my young narrator class? A Novila Blawayo, We Need New Names. Um, that book is like, just an incredible masterpiece and it's so funny um and so i mean about really serious stuff it's about an immigrant from zimbabwe who then ends up in michigan have you have you read that book megan I haven't yet no she has a, she calls it destroyed michigan because that's how she thinks detroit is pronounced <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of jokes there yeah that's another really good young narrator um yeah good question i also i love you know, I, I feel like she hasn't actually written much else aside from this one story from the teenage point of view, but Julie Oranger's The Isabel Fish. Um, it's like a story I, story I read like really young when I was just starting to write and it had like such an effect on me. I thought those teenage characters, a, a brother and sister who sort of lost a friend, um, it's a gorgeous story. Um, she has one Pilgrims too in, um, uh, right. It's in, what is it, How yeah. to Breathe Under Water? Yeah, yeah, it's both of those stories are in that, yeah. Yeah, it's, such so a good book. it's really good. You know, I teach for the Iowa Young Writers Studio and that's like the, uh, for their online version, which is asynchronous even before uh, 
COVID. Um, that's Pilgrim's Vigilie Orders, like the first story on day one. It's like a very heavy, serious story about a young girl whose mother um, is, is dying. And then she goes to like a weird play date at these hippies houses when um, another girl there just falls off a tree house and dies. And it's like, this is the first story I teach to these teenagers on day one, but it's super good. Yeah, the whole book, I Had to Read Underwater is, is really, really good. Um, you know, I was, I went, when I was a teenager, I went to the Iowa Young Writer Studio and yeah. had that sort of shocking kind of thing of like day one being like assigned a story that just like blew my mind of like nothing like I'd ever read before. I didn't know that like, you know, as a high school student in Michigan, I didn't know that like short story collections existed. You know, I just like- What would you? I don't think I- There was like a literature that. book and like, there were some stories in there or right. something, but I didn't realize you could like, <laughs> Go out and buy a book of stories. Like a that was book of story. you know? One author. Yeah. What was the? Do you remember what was the story that you read that you were like? Yeah, and actually, it's also about teenagers. It was called The Hole by Andrew Porter, um, and it it's from his collection that I can't remember the name of, but um, it's about two teenagers, and there's a like a sewer, sewer hole at the end of this one kid's driveway. And his parents, instead of like recycling them like they're supposed to, his dad dumps his grass clippings in that, like um, in the sewer. And the kids climb down there just as a joke. And because of these grass clippings, there's um, like, I'm like, my science is not so good, but there, it, it, the kid climbs in there and dies because there's gas build up from these like grass clippings really, really sing like oh. methane or something. I don't know, but like, don't quote me on that, but um, wow. it's like, yes, very like children dying is what our young writer studio introduces. Who is the teacher? At uh, Thisby Nissen, who also writes excellent young characters. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, yeah, I know that name. That's a big, it's funny to think of the things because I did like a summer workshop too in high school and yeah, it just blew my mind. Like, I, at first, I didn't know anyone else liked to read as much as I did. And then two, I also, I think was like, oh, there are these things called short stories that aren't in my anthology. Um, right, yeah, that weren't in the literature textbook. And it um, it was a really important sort of thing. So the work you do there is like very good. It had a huge impact on me and my sort of writing life going forward. Yeah, for sure. Uh, we have a question about whether you recommend an MFA for over 30. Um, I say yes, for sure. Um, I don't think you're ever too old, like over 30 is not old. Um, and sometimes coming at it later might be better because you will have a better sense of who you are as a writer and more appreciation of the free time or the, you know, the time you're given to write as opposed to coming straight from college and being like, this is more work in classes, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Megan, what do you think? Absolutely. I mean, there's no right or wrong time to do an MFA. It's there, it's absolutely like it's individual. And also there's not like there's not going to be a moment where you wake up and you're like, aha, yeah. now it's time to the MFA. It's just like what is going on with your life. Like when when might be a good time for you, you know, that you like find the right program, find the right place. Like, can you move forward if you want to? Do you want to move or do you not want to move? Like. Those are just all like personal decisions. And absolutely, I think you can do an MFA like any point in your life. And if it's what you want to do, it's you're going to find value in it if it's something you want to do. Like, I don't think many people get dragged like kicking and screaming into an MFA program. So like, <laughs> definitely, you're going to, yeah. <laughs> I would say, I, would, I, think, I think we had a real range. We had a few people like brilliant geniuses straight out of undergrad. And I was like, how did you do this? I was rejected from Iowa straight out of undergrad and my rejection note had a typo in it. And it was so sad. Um, and then we had a bunch of people in their thirties and then a, a few people in their forties and then even some people in their fifties. Um, you know, so I would say it was like, I was 30, 31 when I graduated and I was like in the, maybe at the midpoint, you know, I don't think I was like the old person there or something. Absolutely. No, likewise, it was, um, one of the great things about Rutgers, the MFA program that I did, it was a wide range of age, age ranges, um, where people were at in their life. Um, yes, and I see Peter um, says, mm -hmm. so, 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 um, thank you for coming here. Peter is one of the 
book club, my, my work, we do book clubs online and, and Peter has joined some of our book clubs. So we've been talking about Jane Austen on, on Twitter. Um, oh, so thank you for coming. Do we have like anyone like with the last question? The question? It could be totally embarrassing about UC Davis and yeah, I think there's kind of like one more question if there's one. Our husbands are on. This is my husband's first time at one of my events because he's always watching our daughter during them, and this one's late enough. Richard Seeger wants us to share a funny UC Davis story. Oh, wow. Which how, There are so many to choose from. Um, Dan, you agree with Richard. Um, huh. Um, there was a time Danny was at a party at Richard's house and fell into a lake with his iPhone. That's a funny story that doesn't even involve us. <laughs> right, we can't we can't get embarrassed about it because it wasn't it wasn't us. Um, I I broke I, I dropped a six pack of shock top on the concrete and it smashed. It broke, and Danny said that's shocking. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that. Was that on? Was that, on, up, was that on picnic day? It, I think it was on picnic day. Yeah, there was a, yeah, we have picnic day as a whole. <laughs> Explain it. It's like, there's no, it's at UC Davis every year. It's a big farm party. There's animals and there's drinking later and it's really fun. And yeah, it's a great place for writers, you know, picnic day, so. Yeah, everyone should go. <laughs> <laughs> in California should go to picnic day when it's yeah we're trying to Danny's Danny's really loquacious tonight in the chat they're trying to bring it to Auburn where we also have big farm aspect to the college but a little more conservative <laughs> less drinking in the streets it's Danny's important cause is <laughs> in Auburn oh my gosh um, um, question serious yeah. question joke question burning question. I still have a sip of wine left. Well, this is, I mean, you know. This has been so fun. I mean, I could, we won't keep uh, book soup or all of you here <laughs> till midnight, but I do feel I could just talk until midnight. I had all these questions ran down that were like my literary craft questions, but it was such a joy, Maria, to get to talk to you about your book and how you thought about these things, how your career has grown. And it's honestly, it's been such an honor, like being a, being a part of, being or your friend throughout throughout this journey. And this it's an honor to be, to be your friend from, from picnic day to our mid thirties, you know, we're, we, we've come a long way and we'll keep going. <laughs> and um, her book is If the Body Allows It, it's so, so good. Um, and I can't wait for it for the full novel. There it is, there's my novel. Yeah, here we have a one last pitch. As Maria, I think Maria suggested that you buy dozens of copies. Yeah, each. a few dozen each, just to support your indies and us. You know, it's, that yeah. would be a lot tonight. Um, and tomorrow, happy Independent Bookstore yeah, Day tomorrow. Happy Independent Bookstore Day. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm excited. It's going to be pouring rain here tomorrow, but I'm going to try to make it to our our local indie. <laughs> I wish it would Thank pour you, rain. Thank you so much. Yeah. Happy. Thank you both. This was such a great conversation and so good for aspiring writers. And I'm going to send it to my my writing classmates from oh. class last year. So yeah, really, really great. Thank you both so much for being here and championing independent bookstores. Oh, we have one more question maybe. Oh, oh um, yes, this will be archived. It stays up on here on our Crowdcast page. So if you save the URL or bookmark it, you'll actually be able to rewatch it like right after this. Um, I think it does like a quick little thing, but it, you should be able to rewatch. And then we will also put it up on our YouTube channel. Oh, so thank, thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Thank well, thank, thank you for joining you. us on a Friday of all days. We so appreciate it. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, it was so wonderful. Great Friday night. <laughs> Thank yes. you all for coming. Thank you for Thank coming, you. everyone. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Thank you, Book Soup. Yeah.